Today's edition of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that I've been lucky enough to be using for a little over a year now. Only rivaled by the impeccable customer service that Kevin and his staff provides, Coach Me Plus's ability to constantly be amoeba-like in their ability to mold and, and matriculate what you're trying to get across and bring together is, is absolutely fantastic. Their constant pursuit of better ways and better methods and, and innovations and progress to their own product is absolutely fantastic. Go over to CoachMePlus.com, check out what they got, guys. It's, uh, it's something that I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down with the founder of Sparta Performance Science, Dr. Phil Wagner. Dr. Wagner and I started talking a little bit about tech, what you should be looking to get out of it, what questions you should be asking and what purpose it should hold. And then we get into their tech and what they look at with the force plates, with the three curves, defining all of those. Um, and then we get into exercises that have a large carryover to it. And a few of his answers really caught me off guard, but I thought, you know, I think it's really awesome that he's so open and willing to share the research that they're doing uh, and, and provide this information for us, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Doc, thanks for being on with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Jay. So let's talk a bit here about the tech and what we can do and talking about getting coaches better. Yeah, I think the big challenge that that uh, I guess I've seen uh, with tech is it's, um, it, it, you know, not being used in the way that a lot of technology and other industries use it, you know, like it's used in business really to help make people's lives easier um, and and really validate those that are doing a great job. Um, and so I think really trying to continue to search for ways that tech makes coaches' lives easier and validates, you know, the, the philosophies they're doing is a real key, I think, at least from an abstract standpoint of where the field needs to evolve into with more technology that's present. I think that's a great point, especially because – the one thing that everyone that's involved with it says is, you know, why do you want to use whatever it is and what are you hoping to accomplish from it? Yeah, and I think that latter point you, you mentioned is even is the most powerful. You know, what do you hope to accomplish from it? Because I think, you know, as as coaches, and I used to be a strength coach, so for this th this time I'll say we – you know, so I think we as coaches, you know, have to almost work backwards, you know, from that question of what do you hope to accomplish from it? Um, that should be the first question to ask, not what should we get, right? Because um, ultimately technology should help change or support what we're doing um, that's, that's positive. No doubt about it. And hopefully in a positive sense, looking at actual performance with athletes. So Let's touch on some like performance markers and things that we should be looking at and, and developing and going from there. Yeah, I think, you, you know, t to me, you know, performance is a tricky word because, you know, injury prevention and performance, if they're done right, are um, the same, you know, because to me, you know, a heavy squat certainly affects performance. But if somebody's strong eccentrically, it's also going to help prevent injury. So I think also kind of, I guess taking a step back and saying, I mean, we use the term a lot of resilience, you know, because you want somebody that's both strong, but if they get bent out of shape, they can snap snap back relatively quickly uh, to that original shape. Um, I think the performance markers that we look at um, are, are really based are, are based off force metrics, um, you know, and sometimes people forget that force is is really strength because strength is just the ability to apply force, um, whether that's done. Over a long time or a short time, that's where it gets tricky for us as coaches. Um, so the, the main metrics that we look at are an eccentric rate of force development, that initial development, what we call load. And then we look at concentric rate of force, um, really trying to reverse directions after you've decelerated. We call it explode. And then you've got your concentric impulse, which is your drive. That's that prolonging of force production and probably the one that's most misunderstood because a lot of times people are like well what do you mean we want to produce force over time um and a lot of sports don't 
right? Obviously, if a lineman's really good at producing force over, you know, a longer time, that doesn't really help you if a D lineman's coming right at you, you know. But from a pitching standpoint, a lot of rotational athletes, they control the tempo. And so actually, they need to have a longer uh, phase of force production, a pitcher, a golfer. Um, even in football, we found a lot of NFL teams, long snappers, produce this longer force over time. All these people that rely on timing, which is just a different expression of, of force or strength. Okay, so let's dive into those three metrics a little more. Yeah. And let's explain those a little better because I think everyone in the world has seen like, you know, the V curve, which yeah. is pretty much what we're talking about here. Yeah. So let's get into it and let's let's start with the eccentric and go from there. Yeah, so that eccentric rate of force development really begins at the onset of the movement um, and then proceeds all the way till that deceleration portion ends, you know, in the way that um, – you know, the way that we found it supports coaches in their programs, this is probably the one that's really critical uh, as the primary eccentric measurement. So when people talk about, are you strong or not? That's the most important metric, right? Because that tension, that force is, is, is initiated in this period, that eccentric period. We found, uh, interestingly enough, that any heavy movements support that phase, um, squats the most effective because it's both eccentric and heavy, but anything heavy affects that because bench is actually the number three way to boost that in a vertical jump, which is fantastic. And so what we found is squat, deadlift, and bench are the top three values to affect eccentric rate of force development in a vertical jump. And so the only theory – we know that for a fact stats-wise – the only theory after that can be like, okay, so what does the deadlift, squat, and bench have in common? There's a reason why those are the three events in powerlifting, right? They're the most capacity to add weight. And so just being strong or adding weight improves the system's ability, the entire system ability to create eccentric rate of force. Wow. Now, I definitely, if you gave me five <laughs> guesses, bench wouldn't have been one of them. I know, our, ourselves included. Yeah, yeah, we didn't expect that. So, but when we look at that, and, and I understand it can connect the dots with strength, but wouldn't we almost want to look at how fast that occurs as well? Absolutely. And that's where the, you know, the next phase comes in, right? You know, we have to be careful as, as coaches, right, or any practitioner to not evaluate one phase in isolation. So that next phase, that concentric rate of force, you know, that's the ability to really change direction quickly. So if that initial portion is fast, it makes it very easy to make the ensuing period fast as well, the concentric rate of force period, because you've set it up accurately. And so that concentric rate of force begins basically at the moment that athlete's at the bottom of their jump all the way until they leave the plate. The, the variables that we've found to affect that are actually more velocity related. And so, which makes sense, you know, things, things that are more skill related, but even, uh, a movement like suitcase deadlift or farmer walk is the most effective lift in there. And the theory as to why is it's the most bracing that's involved. And so the athlete is primarily trying to resist rotation or, you know, overextension or overflexion It's just locked in that position, which when you think about concentric rate of force, which is reversing quickly, it makes sense, right, that if you don't leak in your trunk or your, your core area, right, if you're not leaking there, then it's easier to reverse direction quickly. Yeah, and we're two for two with things that I wouldn't have guessed so far <laughs> in this conversation. I, I think it's an important part about technology is that you have to go in open-minded. You know, we've gone into a lot of these things open-minded saying we're going to follow the data, right? That doesn't mean that we're going to – do a single arm row standing on a BOSU ball blindfolded, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're not talking about the extremes variations. Um, we're just what, – what it has allowed us to do is reprioritize who gets what lifts and in what order they perform them based on their importance. No, 100%. And I love the fact that you're talking about how, you know, 
you you don't blindly do it, but the data needs to drive, you know, the bus for, for right. the direction you're going. Because you see so many people who are so, uh, I don't know, married to certain exercises. <laughs> sure. I've heard know? that before. Yeah. Um, how do you discuss with coaches then that yeah. – because you sit here and you think about what we're talking about, and a lot of people they're going to say, "Well, a full clean's got to be top." Nope. Yep. Like for neither of them. And now, I mean, we can get into the Olympic lifting discussion for a billion years after this. Uh, we're going to need a beer, or some bourbon, though, to really get through that. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about how that communication process goes when you're talking with coaches about the process and the data and following the numbers. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. Is we all, we all have a philosophy bias, right? Where there's certain movements or things that we like because it fits our specific Excel template, right? That we've created and masterminded over years, or we're we're really good at coaching that activity. You know, my background is Olympic lifting. I competed as an Olympic lifter. I love cleans, love snatches, love coaching them, love doing them. But at the same time, they're also more skillful than the other movements. And so that's why we think it didn't have as large of an effect on explode as the other things. Hmm. Is there's a huge skill component. So it's hard to say, well, did I get better at clean and snatch or did I produce force faster? Because they're not the same thing, right? There's a lot of mid thigh pulls. A great story is I spent six weeks with the English national team last year in England and they do a, a, a test called the mid-thigh pull, isometric mid-thigh pull. And they do it to assess max force production when you're standing on a plate. And I Oh, bet, yeah, Brad DeWeese does that too. Yeah. Yeah. So I bet the entire staff that I would produce more force on that movement than any of their players. And I'm 180 pounds. I'm not a big individual. But my bet was based on the theory that because I Olympic lifted – heavily for so long that my skill is so much better that I would be able to outperform some of the strongest players in the UK. And I actually did that. Nice. I actually was able to do that because I get under the bar, my feet were in a better position. My back was in a better position. I had a hook grip. My elbows were turned out. All these like little tricks of Olympic lifting allows you to move more weight. So I think that's the challenge with why we didn't see cleans there. But, but I think back to your question of, how do we get through the personal bias? You know, I think we, I think you have to have colleagues around you that also have different philosophies that if everybody has this group think of, you know, we're going to follow the data, it helps. You know, at Sparta, you know, Mike, who's been on your podcast and, and, and some others, they have different philosophies. They're not Olympic minded centric like I am. They have other philosophies, you know, and so when they all come together, if everybody stays open minded and follows the data, you know, it tends to break down some of those walls or, or previous marriages to use your term. No. Um, and that's, that's fantastic. So then let me ask you the next question being, we've gone from one to two, then what does the third phase show you? Yeah. The third phase shows you how long that force production, uh, occurs for. And so, um, the best example we use is we work with a lot of baseball players and when a pitcher's heel leaves the mound, the pitch is over. They can't do anything after that. It's done. And so a lot of times a pitcher's goal is to stay connected to that mound as long as possible in order to develop more force and more exit velocity on the baseball. Right. And so that's how if we think about, you know, prolonging force, right? That's really what that concentric impulse, that third variable is. That's awesome. And then what have you found? So we talked about the first two. What's the, uh, you know, to stay with baseball, what's the curveball you're going to throw me at this one? <laughs> so, yeah, I think w what's been interesting is, you know, we started off and it was mostly single leg, you know, because, and then one of the things that started popping up was overhead squat, you know, started, started creeping in there up the list and you're thinking, okay, what is a single leg movement? Like a, let's say a rear elevated split squat. What does that have in common with an overhead squat? Right. Cause they're pretty different. Mm -hmm. The one shared characteristic is the time of the movement takes longer. 
right? Because in an overhead squat, right, there's so many mobility challenges that you can't bomb it, you know, down in the hole and out quickly, right? So that's really what those shared char- characteristics have is that group, the movements take more time, you know? That's interesting. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. neat, though. And so the plyos that we use are, you know, broad jump, things that, like, are more prolonged and connected to the ground for a longer period of time. Oh, no, that's – that I like. That, that yeah. I like a lot. Yeah. So then the one question, because we just talked about max strength leading into basically anti-flexion rotation, you know, yep. and then – Almost like body control on the third part, which brings, brings a great question that I guess we ask ourselves all the time, and that is, do you guys determine how strong is strong enough then? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, that's a tough question. Um, I think that's where that, that term resilience comes into play is that you, know, you want to have a, an athlete perform well. But there also has to be a, a minimum level of weakness present as well, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, if an athlete is, is on the – I talked with the MLB general manager uh, last week, and he explained that – trying to explain to his scouts that if a player is good but he's on the bench the entire year because he's injured, it really doesn't matter how good he is, right? And that was actually a difficult concept to to understand for the scouts, right? But – that's kind of where that resilience comes into play and how much is too much, you know, the way we do it. And I think this is an opportunity for the strength field in general is we've got to start aggregating information across each other more. So that way we know what is, you know, a minimal accepted threshold is. And some of these values are, I mean, the way we do it on a force plate is we get T scores based on everybody's data coming together and then you know, okay, yeah, well, that value needs to be above 40. And so, therefore, we need to boost that up before we start working on performance more. So I think it's trying to, to aggregate. Everybody's got to aggregate, hopefully, their own data, but then, and then others to come up with more thresholds, right, of when that switch has to occur. No, and that's freaking brilliant because you're looking at three completely different things. Yeah. And – I guess now let's dive into how you identify that and how you build it and then where people should be going after that. Yeah. So the way, the way we've uh, identified is they get assigned a number. And then what we've, what we've done is we work a lot with data scientists um, and they take all the workouts that are being done and they'll compare it to the changes in the force play. Right. So, once you, you, you see these changes, you start to associate different patterns of, oh, this movement does that, and this group of movements does this. So if, if you know, somebody has a really high drive, you know, which is that last variable, that would indicate the other two aren't as relatively high, then a, a plan automatically gets assigned. In that case, it would be squat and deadlift. Because we talked about squat, because it's heavy, being a largest effect on load – deadlift being number two, but then also remembering deadlift has a shared effect on explode, right? So that this is where it gets really tricky, and, but at the same time is where data and technology can help because the decision tree starts to get pretty big there of like, okay, how do we make this decision? And so once that plan's assigned, goes to the athlete's phone, and then they log the workout to complete the loop because I think the other challenge in strength conditioning is – there might be printed workouts that are used or cards and athlete writes it down. You know, what happens to that data? What happens to that information? Does it go into a file cabinet? You know, the, the visual I have in my mind is like Indiana Jones when they wheel that at the end of the movie or they wheel the relic, you know, in the crate back with all the other crates, you know, never to be seen or heard from again. I think I see that going on a lot with the workout cards, right? They get put in this file cabinet like, you know, an Indiana Jones ending, almost. Yeah, it's crazy. This is the second conversation I've had within the last 30 minutes where there's been an Ark of the Covenant um, reference. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, so. It, it, I was hoping not to date myself there where I didn't appear too old. 
Yeah. Oh no, I, it's Indiana Jones and and that is the Raiders of the Lost Ark will will never be a movie that will ever be considered old. Um, yeah, yeah. But no, so that's fascinating. So then, the kid walks in, takes a jump, two or three, yep. and then immediately, because heaven forbid they're anywhere without it, pulls right. this out and it tells them precisely what they're doing. That's right. Yeah, I think it's an important point. You know what you said. They aren't. The athletes are never without their phone, right? And then if you can't beat them, you join them. You know, sometimes a good good approach, right? And so, you know, bringing bringing the program and the information to the athlete because in this day and age, you're going to search it anyway. We we call it the Google generation, right? If we don't educate them, they're going to Google it that question anyway and likely get far worse answers. And so we've got to be proactive, whether it's on their phone or showing them through graphs, you know, what this all means, what the data means. Oh, no doubt. But at least they're asking exercises. They're not asking, you know, what their sickness is and they're pulling up WebMD with everything. But right, right. <laughs> that's a whole yeah. other ball of wax. So absolutely. what input does the coach have then on that decision process that goes to their phone? So the coach, you know, really – Sometimes I think, at least in our case, the confusion with Sparta is that we're telling people what to do, you know, and that they've got to do those workouts. You know, if that were the case, we would never know the effects of different exercises, right? Because if everybody's doing the same thing, right. you know, then no, no discoveries are made. So it works to our advantage from a technology company that everybody is doing their own thing. So, you know, certainly there, there's some – there's shared movement pieces to that, but everybody's going to have a different program, if not exercises, then loading schemes, right, or rest periods or combos, whatever it might be. So a coach goes in there and, and really creates their own rules engine, right? So when you go in, you're saying, okay, well, if my load is low, I don't want to do squat. You know, I want to do bench instead, right? Or if, I, if my drive is low, I don't want to do overhead squat. I'd, I'd like to do a movement that I think has a longer time progression, you know? And so there's that creativity there, but also the objectivity where the coach can define what rules go into play under what conditions. Hmm. No, I like I think that. Ultimately, ultimately what our software is trying to do for the industry is, is, you know, help develop some best practices and standards Right. So it starts to really develop that validation, not just among strength and conditioning, but more importantly, in the medical community, in the administrative community of like, wow, these athletes are spending the most of the time with strength and conditioning and the gains they're getting out of it are so, so great. How do we write? How do we value or invest more in this space? Yeah. And getting more money into the weight room is always a good thing. So if we're looking at different things and you're able to see everything, what are some examples of some things that you thought would work <laughs> that people were doing that ended out actually not working? Well, I think, you know, the Olympic lifts were, were right up there, you know, that, that not only I have a personal bias towards using them, but um, really appreciate how effective they can be. So that was surprising. Um, and a lesson, I guess, to learn that how powerful the skill is of a movement um, and probably reinforces the need and continued need for more coaches, right? Because a lot of these movements are skilled, right? And, and, and require some pretty heavy instruction. So that was a surprise. I guess the other surprise, uh, you know, we covered was the bench, right? How, yeah. you know, and I, but I think each of these has lessons, right? If, if you appreciate the skill of a movement was the first lesson. The second lesson learning that bench affected your lower body eccentric rate of force. The, the lesson I took away is like how powerful the system is, right? And so rather than going after, you know, upper versus lower, right? We all do upper lower splits. The question is why? Why are we doing an upper lower split? Um, because it, we're training the system. You know, so it's not up or lower, right? That the body doesn't split you up like that. You know, I had a great friend of mine uh, as a head strength coach at Penn, Jim Steele, mm -hmm. and uh, 
you know, we talked quite a bit, Jim and I, and <laughs> he said, if someone had a gun to your head and they told you you had to squat a thousand pounds by the end of the month, would you only squat on your lower body day on Mondays? Like, so it's physiologically possible to lift lower and to squat more often than we do. The question is, do we need it or does the individual need it? Right. And then how do we progress it? Right. But, um, trying to break free of some of these constructs of upper versus lower body, right. Or heavy versus light. The real question is, what do you need as an individual? No doubt. And I, I think we need to backtrack quick before people turn this into some viral war between strength coaches. Neither of us in any way, shape, or form are saying that you should not use the Olympic lifts. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Olympic lifts. Right. I love them. But we just and, said and we, that. And we use them. We use them in our training facility. Uh, we, we use them knowing that it's a high level of skill and a movement that's worth coaching and worth developing that skill yeah and i think that if you're going to work and you're going to develop it i think that that is probably the most important thing and it comes down to it with all these exercises is that it is that's a skill right. and even the three portions of the jump that you're looking at is still breaking down it's just breaking down the skill into yep. more specific components that's and right. then sort of using special exercises to help correct or improve or whichever term we want to use now for athletes those aspects yeah. of the skill absolutely yeah absolutely and it's it's awesome and i think that people need if it's just anything to take away from this to look more at what they're doing and how its effect is on what they're putting out on the field mm. you know because you guys have an absolutely fantastic way of actually displaying that information and helping coaches. But like you said, you know, if we're just going to, you know, make sure that the Nazis don't have the Ark of the Covenant and take it and put it in a warehouse somewhere with all right. the rest of our workouts, how are we going to ever know that Johnny got better because Johnny did X, not because Johnny didn't do Y or Johnny did Y before and it's carryover index was what's better. And I think that that's a huge point. Yeah. I think it, and it's also when we've got to educate people that aren't in this industry within our own organization, whether it's university, a pro team, you know, how do that's where also where technology can help, right? Because you want to be able to show them graphically at a simplistic level, how they've improved and how it's affected that, you know, performance on the field or on the court. Yeah, because at the end of the day, performance enhancement and injury reduction should be synonymous. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and I love that. I love that. I, I love everything you guys are doing. You know, it's great sitting here talking with you, you know, and it's great sitting talking with all the people that you have on staff. And it's every time I talk with the people that work with you guys, whether it be Hootie or Horn, they've got nothing but the best things to say. So it's. People need to be more involved in sharing information and getting involved in companies like yours that are trying to make us better as coaches. Yes. Yeah. There, well, there, there's so many great people in the industry. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're certainly grateful to, to be working alongside Ryan and, and Andrea. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a win-win. Well, That's yeah. what you want to make of all these relationships, right, where everybody, you know, gets better. No doubt about it. Well, Doc, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. This is absolutely awesome. I have a feeling there's going to be a huge spike in suitcase carries and people squatting, <laughs> deadlifting heavy here. But uh, I can't thank you enough, man, and it's, I really do appreciate you being on. Jay, thank you. All right. Well, you have a great day. We'll be in touch real soon. Thanks a lot, Jay. Take care. You too. And a huge thanks to Dr. Wagner for spending some time with us and being so open and honest with his sharing today, guys. Just, you know, the whole idea, obviously, that injury prevention and athletic performance should be synonymous. And then getting into the research they're doing, how they're coming up with these numbers, exercises that they're seeing have the best carryover. I mean, that's really fascinating to me. And I, I can't thank, you know, Dr. Wagner and everybody out there at Spartan Performance Sciences enough for everything that they're doing to better the field. And, you know, Dr. Wagner for being so open and honest with us today. And if you guys enjoyed the talk as much as I did, 
please share it through a social media outlet of your choice. Tweet it, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it may be. Again, guys, just trying to share great information to all the coaches out there. And thank you guys for listening and everything you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.